Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin, and um, warm welcome to all of you. Um, looking out of my window, I can see that it's um, warming up the weather, and um, hopefully that it will be a bright, uh, sunny weekend for all of us. Um, we have another fantastic uh, session for you today, and um, we are grateful for joining us. Uh, I'm, I hope and I'm sure you will enjoy the session, which will be about the pitfalls and pleasures of creating new communities. One, a subject that is very close to the heart of all our members and all urbanists. urbanists. Um, the presentations will be made by two uh, senior people um, from Scott Brownrigg. Um, uh, we have Paul Hoxton, who is a director at uh, Scott Brownrigg and head of in, uh, residential, responsible for uh, the southeast, uh, for projects in the southeast of the country. Uh, Paul will talk to us about uh, Centenary Key, a former CETA, remember that word, CETA, now home to England, of course, uh, site in Southampton, uh, which was a former shipyard. And uh, he will take us through the challenges of uh, 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 undertaking the master plan and implementing a development over the last 10 years or so. We also have Lucy Feinberg, a senior urban designer at uh, Scott uh, Brownricks. And Lucy will take us through a very innovative and uh, new urban design approach, which uh, was developed at uh, Scott Brownrigg uh, using an international uh, 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 competition that uh, they took part in. Um, we look forward to the presentations and first uh, we go to Paul. Okay, thank you Andreas. Just bear with me while I share my screen. Yes. Whilst Paul, Whilst Paul is ready, can I just um, remind, remind everybody, everybody, please remember to uh, post any questions or comments during the presentations. I will be picking them up and then putting those points to the two speakers uh, during the second half of this event. So get busy, please. <laughs> can I just confirm that everyone can see the slides? No, we can see you, Paul, but not the slides. You can see me, but not the slides. Paul, I'm happy to share your slides here if you if you prefer. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay, perfect. If you want to, yeah, hit slide share. My mouse is acting up. There we go. Okay. And Sorry about this. Didn't work for me either, so it did, yeah. five, it did five minutes ago. My mouse just doesn't want to go onto the slides, I don't know what's wrong. Oh, well, should I try? Let me try this. Okay. Let me just let me just try this, see if this works. That's it. Seems to be Perfect. getting getting there, Paul. Yeah. Sorry, apologies for this. Do Do you find um, um you that technology is is almost as uh, challenging as uh, preparing a ten year master plan? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think I always find that the um. Even the preparation that you make, you do trial runs, and then the the, the, the solving thing still doesn't work. So, um, hopefully, you can see my face. Yep. 
and then it's on the slides are working. If I just flick a slide, is that, yeah, is that working That's now? That's it, yes. Okay, yeah. brilliant, okay. So, okay, pitfalls and pleasures of creating new communities. Um, what I've done here um, is basically just give you all an introduction to centenary key that we've been looking at in Southampton. Um, I've got probably about 25 slides or so, which just give you an idea of some of the key strategic um, solutions that we've created over the last 10 years. Um, we've been looking at this site or working on this site for since 2010. Um, so, you know, my involvement is 11, 11 and a half years, which is, again, on top of other, you know, large schemes that we, we're working on. For me, it's the, it's the time scale, the incredible time scales that these, these kinds of projects take. Um, that's one of the biggest pitfalls for me. Um, not necessarily a pleasure, because um, you want to actually design things, you want to see them built, you want to, you know, engage with the community that lives within them. So. Um, I will do my best to make it as stimulating as possible, and then um, I can come back to various slides and we can have a 15, 20 minute uh, session on questions. Um, for those who don't know, um, the site was the old Bosworth Thornacross shipbuilding yard, and ironically on this part of Southampton, which is across the River Itchen, um, they have never had waterside access because it's you know, back to the sort of 19th century, it's been a shipbuilding yard. Um, and over, one of the most fantastic things is learning about these places, but over 4,000 people will come into this site every single day uh, and leave again. And, and I think from my perspective, when we all struggle with highways, trip generations and capacities within your master plan, Actually, we're, we're slowly but surely bringing back three and a half thousand new residents to this site um, in a completely changed uh, sort of function. And it's just a, a little bit grainy, but that's what happens when uh, you get old, old images. Um, so that, that's the site, the, the scheme, and that's, that's all that's left of it. Um, is the old gates that that um, all those um, shipbuilders used to walk through it day in day out? Um, so we've retained these for use within the public realm as public art. But that is the only sort of memento, really, which it's kind of a shame. Um, but you know, fantastic opportunity to retain a little bit of history. Um, split the slides out again, not knowing how you want to to discuss the scheme and, and what comments you may have, but I've just kind of given an overview of the master plan and then a series of slides showing different ways that we've implemented some of those strategic sort of thoughts. Um, but fundamentally, the urban design principles for, for, our, for the master plan, which we picked up as an outline and then developed and designed since 2010. Um, it's some basic principles, you know, place and space comes first. So you know, the, the spaces within the buildings and at, at top of the buildings and, and the activity um, that we're trying to create is fundamental to reinforcing that master plan and the vision. Um, but then obviously we look at the building form, how those forms relate to space, how we create the right appropriate mass, urban markers, some key vistas into the site to connect to the local surrounding context. Um, and obviously views to the river. So, you know, maximize views for residential, but actually the public and uh, how they interact with the space and, and open up um, uh, the river frontage. And a balance of that is, is introducing the right series of, of mix of uses. And I always struggle with different uses with a master plan because everyone wants to throw every use under the sun at it. Um, and, and planning authorities tend to, to drive those, those uses within their local plan. But actually, some of them are just a red herring. They're just not, they're not feasible in that location. They're not a reality. So there's always a frustration when designing a master plan is you've got everyone's views to take into consideration, but the economic realities are that some of those views just physically will not happen. Um, and that makes a real challenge for the scheme. So the master plan just off to the, the northwest of the site is um, is Victoria Road it runs through to the old high street. So one of the key 
um, elements of the master plan was connected to local infrastructure. Um, part of that early stage um, phase one development was to enhance the whole of um, the high street, the public realm, pedestrian, change the traffic flow. Um, and the majority of this um, kind of master plan now is a 20 mile an hour zone, uh, but also has regenerated the local high street from what was one of the most deprived areas in southern England into actually quite a vibrant, you know, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial little community. Um, one of the key factors when we picked the scheme up was we had a food store in phase two. Can everyone see my cursor just out of interest? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay, great. So yeah, the, the principle was to have a two-story car park there with a food store on top with residential above. Um, but we just it just wasn't practical. Food stores of that sort of nature just don't want that kind of you know double base double basement car park for access. Um, but we also felt that the main footfall would be kept from the heart of the scheme. So one of our initial engagements was to create links to the community through through the introduction of a nursery and the library at this end of the site in phase two, not just build more homes. And then that, that ended up with a relocation of the food store into the public square in the heart of the scheme with cafe, bars, restaurants, public realm, uh, and, and obviously within the pedestrian environment. But as you can see, the arrows are sort of key street views um, from the existing community on Victoria Road through to the river, um, gardens, public gardens, semi-private gardens, but also key vistas to some of our kind of urban markers like we have a 27 story tower that is about half built at the moment still currently on site it's been unwrapped from some cargo containers from china i believe um and slowly progressing um and then the red line to the bottom is is the next is the the final phase so we've we've basically you know done about five sequential phases on this master plan over the years and we're on to the, the final sort of phase six at the end of the site. And I've, what I primarily I've got here is a, a series of, of photos which just demonstrates some of those principles. So it's, it's key vistas as you're approaching the site to, to be reinforced with active uses, residential, you know, let, I always like to let the, the view spread into the site. So don't close views down, open them up, but create intrigue as you're designing your master plan. Um, and phenomenal amount of public realm costs with this site. So the infrastructure costs, road network, public realm, and the quality of the public realm has really set the scene, but that is a massive challenge. Um, when you have to realize that we're in Wolston, which is the, the poorer end of Southampton, across the river, poor connections to the city centre, not great for the train. Actually, the values here are very low, you know, in terms of sales rates as well. Um, so actually, the good thing um, from the retail perspective, actually encouraged a lot of yoke, uh, local uh, businesses to engage with the site and take some of the first units, so more of an entrepreneurial rather than any chains. That was unfortunately that's closed due to COVID, but that was the public library that we in introduced at the end of the high street. Again, is that which is a really good. This is when you know we're talking nine years ago when everyone was closing public libraries and actually Southampton embraced this with our clients and and um, to to make sure that that was delivered. And then at the same time, it's about in terms of the urban design strategy it's about creating and forming a, attractive streets um, but also nature interacts with that so we, we have you know, green walls into this uh, introduced into the scheme not just for screening and softening but they they create a biodiverse habitat um, prime part of the site as high quality public realm um, significant investment you know, this is and it's also a balance between hard and soft landscape um but also residential private amenity space so the all the softening on the right hand side of the diagram is all above a food store at first floor level 
I suppose it's just creating different views, different identities, creating a place, soft landscape parts with hard public art. Actually, it's not, it hasn't been, it's a real challenge, you know, to, to really drive public art into the focus of the whole master plan because it's so vast budget escalates um, and then inevitably gets one of the things that gets cut. So, you know, I think you know, all credit to our clients that actually some of the public art and the, the hard landscape in the public realm have been maintained as a high quality kind of investment, um, which, you know, really does reinforce the sense of place. And then this is the public space stepping down. So the, the master plan has two public spaces, upper square, lower square. Uh, but it's about creating that openness, that pedestrian public realm to the to the um, the riverfront. Although you do view across the river and see a load of cruise car park, uh, multi-story car parks, which is is interesting in its own right. Um, it's also a balance with the ecology. So as part of that public realm and and the high tides and low tides, um, there's a huge amount of um, this snapshot of actually can be released. But beyond this, the ecology baskets and um, levels that we've had to integrate um, within that river edge um, is quite a substantial investment, but, but really softens the edge of the whole, whole site at the, at the same time. And all the plans, you know, I'm sorry, just set that slide a second. All the plans, you know, require flexibility so you know in the planning consent we, we have restaurants at the top of the, of the square um in the view there but actually to the bottom to the right this is all envisaged as being waterfront restaurants actually just there's just not enough footfall there's not enough catchment there's not enough trade um, but what we've done by creating flexible shell um and of a, of a decent proportion in size they we've actually got a gym operator who's taken all of that space and I suppose one of the key key challenges from a commercial perspective is how you design mixed-use multi-use multi, multi buildings when people pull out, you know, people withdraw from the scheme. Um, so, for instance, we had a 72,000 square foot food store. And, you know, with all the will in, in the world and the design and, the, you know, the footfall that that would create, for someone to buy that and then never open it is a massive impact on 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 the uh, the kind of the workings of the of the environment and the, and the master plan. And then what we tried to do is was create a, a range of different spaces wherever we had uh, the opportunity, rather than everything being up to the street front and the street edge and being a hard landscape and creating roads. We tried to create pocket spaces which just give breathing space to the street um, for residents to pause and reflect before entering the building or you know share a conversation with uh, her neighbors and then the next image is actually on top of a, a multi-story car park where we have a couple of stories of apartments with a private residential courtyard fully enclosed um, it's just using that kind of that transfer if you like as a as a medium for, for further activity and use and then collectively, this is just the heart of the of the scheme. But collectively, you piece all those things together in terms of, you know, height, mass, scale, daylight, sunlight, you know, routes through the scheme, views into the into the scheme. Um, our tower is actually being built on this bottom left-hand corner at the moment. And I'll just come on to that in a second in terms of some of the you know, proposed vision. You know, balance of vision against reality. Sometimes, you know, when you have to. We're not building on the Thames here, we're building on the River Itchen in Southampton. Um, and sometimes you can start with a vision, but the economics make it such a challenge. Um, and so you, that's a view, I think, from about the 21st floor at the moment, I think. Um, that, that's one of the biggest challenge for us. Construction costs, value, sales values, we have to take into consideration. You know, we've had to, on this scheme, we've had to build basements against the river, double deck car parking, podiums for amenity space, 
pretty much everything is above ground and on, on something. So when we get into the realms of you know, the, the impact on carbon um, for this one development, it's, there are certain things we're just going to have to change the way we design, reduce parking provision within larger master plans, no matter how well connected they are or not, to help reinforce and support you know public transport to, to connect places better um, but both of these sites you know this is the, the sort of 11 story slab block on the left all of that site is reclaimed from the itchin to form the master plan and and same with our tower so the incredible cost of having that vision and meeting that vision is 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 phenomenal um, and a real challenge with meeting those those kind of returns um, and then it's the the sort of the ecology and the biodiversity of that you know whole scheme every roof that's I suppose ever since I've been in Scott primary I, I haven't built a building without a green roof on it since 2004 every single building so we're, we're talking 20 years now and if uh, for me they're fundamental for not just for biodiversity but greening and outlook of residents but just being the whole environment that we're we're building well, you've got two or three minutes, is that? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. So I can see the counter, don't worry. Um, and then that's where we're currently at. So, you know, this is, this, these were taken a few months ago. Um, you know, the, uh, the challenge of the tower is always interesting from a concept perspective. When someone draw, you know, drafts a master plan with a vision, but they have really nice slender towers with just maybe three or four apartments on a floor plate that really drives a planning um, kind of you know, discussion, debate, argument, um, creates friction because everyone wants the elegance, but no one wants to build 40 stories to make a, a larger building you know, more elegant. So there are some of the things that, although you pick up an outline, there are, there are some elements of an outline consent that do restrict you. So I'd always encourage people to be realistic with an outline, you know, and a, a 27, 30 story tower, you know, it has to have a minimum six to seven uh, apartments just to create some kind of efficiency of floor plate and economics to make sure that works. So that, that gave us a real challenge with the planners. Um, but, uh, but hopefully it's coming through and, and that, that, that's my planning CGI. Um, and I, I'm always intrigued that what we do create as drawings and images end up actually looking like that and everyone always surprises when they when they look the same and it's like well that's what drawings are meant to do um i think just to, because this is the, kind of the end really um just to summarize there's a few other challenges that come along the way like economic um kind of downturns um, coronavirus for instance so the facade of the tower was literally boxed up for a year in southampton docks but you know, just a bit of interesting sort of facts. Um, but also Grenfell come, came along and you know, the risk in terms of height and second cores, we had to re-engineer re this building to get a second stair in, in the building, even though we don't need to, but it's just that kind of risk that the uncertainties, uncertainty within tall buildings that is now created. Uh, and that's, that's what we've had to do. Um, but again, Centenary key as a summary, it's you know it's always about design, urban design, master planning, building design. It's about encouraging permeability, connection to to the place, create a great landscape setting, um, and a new public realm. What a great site to embrace the, the waterfront and the opportunity for that. And I think one of the biggest thing for me is about people. And even on phase two, I, I met some of the new residents, and they were just so appreciative of. The, their first home you know and i think sometimes we have to understand the realist the realism of, of what we do we're creating new places but homes for people we're not living there they are living there so engagement with the community is fundamental and it's, it takes a lot of dedication belief trust bravery commitment and energy and all of those things attributes um to create successful projects and I won't go through this slide, it's most of that. Um, but fundamentally, it's about a team. And that's the only way you can achieve successful 
projects is working as a team and embracing everybody. Um, and there's a few, say a couple of, that's my only pitch for Ander, um, Andreas. <laughs> is, um, you are, you are excused that, uh, Paul. Uh, Fantastic. Yes. That's, that's, our, that's our progress in 11 years. So. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Fantastic. You've given us a, a very, very good idea of the pitfalls and challenges of, a, of quite a large uh, project. Um, whilst Lucy is getting ready, can I just challenge you one more time to tell us about the pleasures of working on such a master plan? The pleasures? Oh, yes. I think being, seeing these buildings come out of the ground, um, pleasures are about creating that place. Um, you know, I love, you know, I've, I've done some building tours down there um, for the local kind of community. We've done building tours for kind of, you know, um, women in construction and think that people like that and uh, councillors, members. Um, but I think for me, it's always about creating things. You know, I hate things that stay on a drawing board. I, you know, it's about getting these concepts into reality. And working, trust me, work really hard. To, it may look simple, it may look dead easy on site once it's there, but the pressures that come into that are a challenge, but are great fun. Um, you know, we had to, we probably had five public consultations through this process for every every phase for mm -hmm. engaging with the community. We do it all the time. Um, you know, the good thing about this scheme, because it had an outline, um, the benefit was lots of those challenging arguments had been had been made at outline consent so our, our challenges were very different through the detail uh, and the community although they st still hung on to some negativity um, because it's you know nimbyism actually they they embraced what the scheme was and it's about that proactive conversation not not a negative i always say come and talk to us we we can design we can manipulate we can change we can influence and I, I always say I've never had a client tell me what I have to do on any site in 25 years. Mm. And if the public, okay. if the public come forward and are proactive, we can embrace their thinking, their thoughts and, and, and engage. Um, but again, like I hinted at, I hinted at is if people living okay. in these communities, that's mm. the biggest pleasure, Andreas. You know, Excellent. This is, this is, this is not for us. This is not for no. designers. I very much, yeah, I very much recognize that, uh, Paul. Yep, thank you, thank okay. you. So um, we'll go on to Lucy now. I'm very intrigued, uh, Lucy, to hear about your new urban design approach. So over to I you. I hope I don't, I'm trying to find it now. I'll just find my, um, oh, goodness me. Uh, there it is, share that. Can you all see that? Not yet. Yes, it's come up. Excellent. So if I go to view and I go to screen mode, hopefully that will also be good. Now, can everyone see that? We uh, are all, we are, we are there. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Paul, for uh, starting the uh, the hour off. Uh, really, really interesting. And um, I actually, I wish I knew more about Centenary Keys than I do. And um, I can't believe it's gone on for that long, but that's how it is, isn't it? Especially with resi and mixed juice. Um, I'm here just to talk about almost um, the other end of the scale, actually, in many ways. Uh, Paul's just spoken about, you know, highly commercial um, and uh, end. And what I'm going to be presenting to you is just a discussion about um, different different ways that we can approach urbanism. Um, and we took an approach or took an opportunity where we uh, entered a competition um, to sort of test out um, some different ideas. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on about it, it was last year um, and it was the AJ competition, the Care in Town back Nang um, in Germany. Um, and um, we entered that um, in May, June last year. Um, the, the brief was actually really, really interesting. And from there, from the brief was where we started, think, started thinking about what the, you know, what the right team might be. Um, 
and the the brief wasn't sort of uh, didn't stipulate anything too um, selective. It, it, they just wanted um, a productive town of tomorrow and adaptive buildings. They wanted to think about what the function of the house is um, and to see leisure and culture, trade and production to be, wants them to be mixed together and diverse housing. And they gave a lot of information about the history of the site um, and such as like the tanneries that used to be there. Um, so the site itself, um, as you can see just from the previous uh, cover image um, is, is set just to is set just to the west of the centre of Baknang along um, the riverfront, and it's it's a brownfield site. So we love that um, in terms of urbanism and regeneration. And from that brief um, that was set, um, I went about thinking about if I can change the there we go uh, about. What, what we wanted the, the team to be. Um, I saw this as an opportunity to think about how we can approach this in a way that um, is a little more open and a little more opportunistic. Um, and I personally um, uh, come from a background of theatre design. That was my first uh, uh, introduction into architecture actually and um, how I, uh, my first degree. And through that, I met a different sort of kind of people who are much more on the ground in terms of uh, talking about um, culture and uh, society, et cetera, et cetera. And I've always had such a connection with that and um, you know what it means to make a place. And I think it's one of those questions that we all need to be asking ourselves and not just assume we know the answer to it all the time uh, because that's how you end up with these sort of big housing estates um, that look the same everywhere because no one is well we're not questioning hard enough what it means to to develop um apologies if there's a little bit of sound coming through um so i approached this um uh, was given the opportunity to lead the team and so i i brought in um two uh colleagues uh one who is bruce who is on the line right now and he's an uh, architect and urban designer with uh, 30 years of in industry experience. So he had that real commercial head um, and just capability to see the wood through the trees. And also Dagmar Binstead, who uh, introduced um, as a cro uh, cross practice um, architect and who, and she um, had a very strong urbanism understanding, but also cultural understanding, societal understanding of, of the area that uh, Bruce and I didn't. Um, we um, introduced uh, McFarlane uh, and Associates, um, landscape architects, um, who are award-winning and have fantastic public realm expertise. So, um, and they always bring something to the table um, that you haven't necessarily thought of and um really push you um uh, which is always fantastic and, and I, I love that sort of collaborative approach where you're not pigeonholed into okay so you deal with that you deal with that you're the highways you're the i think the more you collaborate the more you talk and the more you share the stronger um des designs become because you all understand each other better and therefore you can have a, a deeper conversation where it becomes a little more uh where the sort of uh was the, the wild card in, in a way uh, that was played um, was I introduced an old tutor from my theatre design course. And I, um, I, I always found uh, this uh, Matthew Hawthorne extremely um, fascinating because um, he wasn't, I don't, I don't like to use, use the term, just a theatre designer. He, he, was a, he was an artist, he was a performer. Um, he, he was a thinker, um, he, he had dabbled with architecture and he, he was an all round just source of knowledge and wisdom um, when I was learning from him. And I felt intuitively that he would have something really amazing to offer to this. 
and um and it turns out that we're absolutely dead on and the, and the team worked really really well together um and his understanding of the written and the spoken word and people and culture and you know the 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 melting pot of life was was really enriched the the process that we undertook and um did that go back sorry this has just it's gone backwards for some reason so just to give you a little bit of I'll, I'll just give you a quick run through of what we did um it's the town of Backnan, which is near stuttgart um in uh, in germany and the site as you can see is located in the center here and just did all the you know the the, the usual background research of the zoning and the the bits and pieces the um the, the existing buildings that were of, that were pertinent, the connectivity, etc. And the thing that I found the most fascinating in this in this process, because um, Bruce and I actually work together a lot on on projects, and we have kind of a way of working. We kind of know what's going to happen in terms of the pens come out. The drawings usually look something like this. Um, for a while and um, and it's both of us just scribbling away and um, doing little doodles to the side and wanting to just kind of bring out some thoughts. But what happened with this process um, with this group of people was so much more conversation than um, that than I'm used to even even though we engage a lot in um, in uh, in history and uh, sociology and thinking in, in what we do, this it was taking this um, to the next level of what does it mean to create new places? And this, and, and, and I found myself reflecting on what was being said. Um, so I was kind of the driver, the, the, the drawer, um, and I ended up being the designer, but it, it wasn't it wasn't this this odd silo. It was a reflective designing process um, that is quite hard to explain because obviously designing is always reflective. Um, but who's doing this again? Doesn't like me doing this. Sorry. Let's say um, you've got three or four minutes. No problem. It's, it's okay. not going to take long. Yeah. Um, so just ran through it with all these little bits and pieces and coming up with little thoughts and ideas of tow boats and just little 3D vignettes of well, what do you see? What do you see? And um, we ended up with, um, with a design that centered around um, from education to commercial. How do these interact? How do these things, how does culture impact on that? And we focused on the sort of the three rings of the circus, which I can explain if if you are kind of interested or you know, but it was more about this kind of approach that was it was about discussion of what it means. So it, it was interesting like that Paul discussed wanting things to speed up, and yes, eleven years in the making, um, trying to get fifteen hundred homes up. It's a problem. It's a problem. We need to be doing it more quickly. But at the same time, um, I'd love sometimes for us to slow down and and have those discussions and and talk to people that bring in a different thought and idea. You know, what is a public space? What does that actually mean? Um, the, the, it, it's understanding people because people want make cities and places places. Um, and that was the, you know, that was the final image. I can thank Bruce for that one um, that we we submitted and we, we happily got through uh, to the to the next round. Um, and yeah, the, the process was completely different from what we used to, but really, really wonderful. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Lucy. No problem. Um, fascinating. Um, very, very interested also to, I'm going to start uh, by asking the first question, uh, the chair's prerogative. Uh, <laughs> um, you you talked to us about your um, university tutor that um, had a theater background. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, 
I don't know if he, if it was just me. I I didn't quite understand exactly what he brought into into this. Yeah. Um, I, I get the point about culture is important and you need to take it on board when preparing a master plan, etc. What exactly did your tutor introduce into the in, in, into the urban design approach that is different to what everybody else is doing? Okay, I think that's. Uh, Bruce did warn me about uh, <laughs> difficult questions. Um, I, 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 I'm not known for difficult questions. It, this, <laughs> this, this, this was an easy one, Lucy, okay? <laughs> oh, good. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I am, if that loads up, what I would like to share, if I can, um, if I stop sharing and I do a new share, yeah, um, I can show you the final board that we submitted and let's try that one can you see that okay Is that, okay it hasn't come up you say has it come up i can i can i can i can read anyway because either you have, yeah. to, you have yeah. to look at me or whatever it's, it's come up. oh brilliant thank you paul um what what Matt brought to the table was uh, it's one it's one of those things and it's a, it's a nuance um, of of depth of understanding um, and the way that we presented uh, the the final um, the final submission um, and I'll kind of read to you what we submitted which for me has had a um, poeticness to it which I don't normally see from the urbanism architecture community as much um, so circulation circus is a canvas for the evolution of Backnang West Circula uh, circus provides an organizing metaphor for a scheme which has it at its heart the provision of an infrastructure around which the community of Backnang can develop their own future in a changing world where human capital has to find an equilibrium with the challenges of technological and ecological change. A circus is principally a site for the exposition of human potential, as a traveling circus brings a stimulus of human potential into the deep fabric of a community. The, uh, the principle of the scheme is to maintain a constant circulation through an environment where living, working, learning and play are in constant interaction and mutual enrichment. Circulation in the scheme flows through the thematic zones, the three rings of the traditional circus, each orientating and extending the existing buildings and infrastructure of the site. Each zone folds around a central event space, operating simultaneously as playground, performance space, marketplace, and public uh, classroom. Um, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I can see the poetic um, vein running through that uh, text, um, which is um, uh, something close to my heart anyway. Uh, poetry has a, a great place in in um, in our lives and and um, as well as and it should in our work as well. Um, can I uh, th th thank you, Liz? I just want to go to some of the questions now. No problem. Um, um, Let's start with uh, Juliet Clark. I think you, um, I think Juliet, your question is to Paul, isn't it? Would you like to put your point? Yes. Hello, hello, Paul. Um, I was interested Hi, to understand once um, you've got people moving into the development, how um, do you then begin to um, physically create? Um, the, the number of communities that will exist because of course there won't just be one within within any development um, were you involved at all in identifying say catalytic people who would draw people together or were there particular events laid on uh, you know how 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 were those people who would create those communities connected together i think i think the um the client team um put put on several kind of um, events um, and, you know, community kind of um, uh, activities in the square and so forth. And, um, and they kept that kind of, you know, a, a regular um, kind of 
structured structure to, uh, to the calendar of those events as well. We, we weren't, as architects, um, we weren't engaged, you know, beyond beyond um, sort of the end of the of the scheme, if you like, or each phase. Um, it, you know, we weren't engaged with that kind of community post development, if you like, which, mm -hmm. you know, apart from ourselves going to meet local residents and, and having discussions off our own bat, um, we've basically been engaged with the professional community, not the residential community, if you like. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really good point. I think it's one of those things that the clients do it as, as you know, quite do it very well. They engage with their new community um, and support them, um, but they tend not to engage consultants within that. So mm -hmm. okay. I, I, think, I would I, like to see a feedback loop that, um, you know, yeah. because as, as the people who create these places, and I, I sit at the front end of the spectrum doing a lot of the socioeconomic and health and wellbeing work for the developments that we work on and um, you know we, we put all this effort in at the front end and then there's just so little monitoring and then feeding back to understand what works well and that gets left really I suppose ultimately to the local authorities over the long long lifespan of you know the places filling up to um, look at the issues and uh, I'm based in Cambridge no it, it shouldn't, shouldn't. Could, it, you um, know, at the end of the day you know I know it's, 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 it's difficult when a, a scheme goes on phase after phase after phase because it, you know, it never feels like it's quite finished. <laughs> but um, right. but as, as architects, you know, we should take it upon ourselves to go and do that for ourselves. And we do that. We try to do that on, on all of our projects. Because um, like I hinted, you know, the, the best feedback you can get is, is for people that love living in the scheme that you've helped design. Yeah. Um, so, and I should never be scared. I always find professionals are scared to find that out, whether they get bad news or not. And it, it makes no difference. It's, yeah. you know, what's there is there. All you can do is learn and improve. So yeah. I, I completely, that circular kind of design and engaging with the residents post-completion is fundamental to the to the next development. And yeah. so, uh, so I think, unfortunately, it, it rarely sits within a fee structure as consultants to, to merit you know, know to encourage well. us to have the time to do it and, and um yeah I, I wish it could be <laughs> i i would say as a director um none of the public events that i've done with the women in construction or the local groups there's no fee for that we, we just do it mm. so ultimately there should be no excuse not to do it you know time when people say time is money no time is just time you know at the end of the day your time is valuable yes but there is so much of it. Um, so yep. ne never, never um, miss an opportunity in that sense. Paul, can I stay with that point? I, I know you, you mentioned that there was public participation um, uh, for every phase of development. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? I, I didn't get, from your presentation anyway, I didn't sure. get the impression that the public, there was, as much engagement as I would have expected. And not, not did I understand how the public may have influenced and uh, altered the original master plan to what they, they finally see on the ground now. I think, unlike say Farnham Town Centre that, that you know, we've worked on over the past, you know, again, 18 years, um, the difference when you pick up an outline consent is some of those hard engaging issues, you know, so when a client has a, jo a joint venture partnership that is fundamentally based on an outline. A lot of those arguments have been made. Um, so the real contentious things about overdevelopment or height scale mass too many cars not enough parking. Most of those had already been dealt with uh, Andreas and so what we what we did was we engaged with the Community phase after phase on, on how they would like to see improvements to Victoria Road, their new, their high street. And, uh, and, and just literally had weekend, of, you know, like you normally would on most schemes, because when you break it down into each phase, they are reasonable size developments to have a, a weekend kind of, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday kind of public consultation in the local village hall. And that, that, was, that was the approach and obviously, the, the client team do um, flyers and leaflet drops and so forth to keep people engaged. Um, 
But I think from my perspective, there wasn't that, unlike Farnham, where there was an awful lot of, uh, of um, interest and lots of people giving their opinions. To be honest, most of most of the issues in in Centenary Key were quite light, and actually they were embracing this new development, you know, landing on their doorstep. Um, mm -hmm. Again, hopefully, it's one of those things that yeah. you know, they they all appreciate. Good. Can I ask? There was a question from David Lam. Uh, David, uh, we are ready for your question. Good. You need to be. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no. Actually, Juliet's uh, question is coming from the same sort of um, motivation as my question, which was really um, having had some involvement on Centenary Key in my former life. Um, it's, I, I, I was interested to know, you mentioned, I think you said three phases, then there were six phases. Um, your involvement, Paul, over 10, 11 years um, is with those phases. Were the I imagine, and I have to say I'm getting old now and I can't remember more than a decade back, but there was probably nearly a decade's worth of work going on with the original master plan for Centenary Key. Am I right or have I just lost the plot? No, absolutely. I think I think part of the, the title that Andreas put in there was about competition and how, you know, how that changes things. I think the reality for me, this is a 20-year project so far and it's probably got another five years to go. Um, so the original kind of brief uh, from Cedar, because they had um, a, a Rogers scheme, didn't they, originally? Yeah, which, that's my recollection. He did the yeah. master plan and then he was no so he, longer involved. <laughs> yeah, so he did it. So what happened, I'll just give you a little bit of background yeah. very quickly. What happened was Rogers was employed by Cedar to create a vision, okay? Which, to be honest, created a, a you know three windswept, windswept streets, all southwest orientated, to just blow the hell out of the streets. But that was my opinion. Um, and and then what, just say what you're thinking, Paul. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, and ultimately, I think for me, it's one of those things that you can you can create something that the expectations are just taken too high. You know, so for me, the scheme kind of looked like it should have been in Hong Kong. Um, but ultimately, um, Cedar then put the, the scheme out to um, competition, OGU, and obviously Crest Nicholson won with their master planner, who was Patel Taylor. And then from that outline principle, we then picked the work up to deliver the whole detail for, for the master plan and, and change it, move it around, uh, and basically adapt every aspect as we've as we sort of develop the scheme through so it's again it's not just the 10 years we've been on it it's the briefing the yeah. strategic planning before that it's a 20 year it's a quarter of a century yeah. by the time it's, it's, it's finished absolutely this is this is my interest in yeah. this and what you're talking about is, is a pinprick in two decades worth of uh, yeah. conceiving yeah. a project uh, which is so uh, I think I'll say what I'm thinking, so disjointed in its, uh, the way uh, expertise was uh, sort of gained, that um, my problem is that the neighbourhood, the people, the citizens of this place, which didn't exist originally, their involvement has been nothing beyond consultation. Now, everyone would say, well, that's fantastic, there was consultation, but the engagement and the involvement Definitely. is almost... Mm. You know, yeah. This, um, David, very, very important point, uh, which actually takes us back to Lucy, doesn't it? Um, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes uh, before we finish. So I'm going to ask our two speakers uh, the same question, which is, um, uh, Lucy, having heard what Paul has said, do you think that um, uh, there was enough uh, attention paid to what you called culture and societal uh, interests and and then uh, Paul, can you answer the same question, please? Do do you think that you had much to do with um, the culture of the emerging place, or was that already predetermined, and um, there was very little that you could do about it? Who's going to go first? Okay, Lucy, I'll, yeah, I'll go. Okay. Oh, um, yep. I think, I think as David's alluded to, I think a lot of that dialogue 
happened before we got onto the, the onto the scheme and yeah and, and our part was more about uh, in informing rather than you know than engaging um but but you know we we did engage through public events but the reality is when a scheme is for me is so far down the line if you like as a, a you know 10 years into an idea what happens what happens is it becomes not necessarily a process but it becomes um it's inevitable that it's going to happen um the more more economic um issues become the the key drivers because the client's got an outline consent if you like um but it doesn't still doesn't mean that you, you don't engage with people you don't listen you don't um ask their opinions um and i think for us i think a lot of schemes some adapt some don't and and i think um you, you just have to try and embrace as much journey as you have opportunity and and again as consultants the majority of that is controlled by others and you know we we can do our bit as much as we can but it, a lot of these things are out of our control if you like you know yeah. even, even presenting to you guys today in, in real in realistic terms i should get permission to share the photos and share you know with various people and but you know it's yeah then in, in it's how, informal forum and uh, you know it's yeah it's about the real world get on with life you know yeah so but that's okay. my thoughts it's, thank you Paul. Enga en engagement is the key word not consulting not not presenting not you know yeah but, absolutely but, and i think you see that more potentially more on schools you know different building typologies are, mm. are much better at it because they have they have they engage more um, yeah and okay lucy if you're going to have the last word oh the last word no no no. i think um it, it's it's really really interesting because i think um i think it, it's one of those conversations that you could have another whole discussion about mm -hmm. and you can't really deal with it in the two minutes you're going to speak and i think you know paul basically was saying when they got on board it the, the deal was done essentially and yes you mm -hmm. can do the go through the process but actually everything's been decided and you know that's true um and i think the the question is 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 quite loaded um do we do we consult in the right way do we participate do is that is that conversation happening and you know when we are bringing forward larger developments particularly when you're dealing with like greenfield sites and things like that it, you're normally just dealing with resistance um rather than people engaging and does that mean we should think about how we engage? Because is this process not, it doesn't appear to be a positive process and it's more about people feeling like they're not listened to or, they, um, or they're not involved in the decision-making. And probably the truth of the matter is, is they're not because if once a site has been allocated, it's been allocated and what happens with it is, you know, you can say, you know, you want a school or, you know, you, you have, you have certain desires, but actually that number of homes has been allocated to that site. So I do think it's quite tricky because it's sort of, how do you go about it? And I think it's it's quite a big question, but I think doing so in a way, and I don't have the answer that doesn't feel so detached is potentially, yeah. but then at the same time, the reason why we do what we do is because we have we we've trained and we learn and we are you know we do it because you know we're all good at it and that's the point of it and people who are in that those sorts of positions should be doing it and um so it, it's it's an extremely complicated situation yes. um okay. so <laughs> great sorry thank you Lucy. yeah of course you two seconds yeah. i think the key thing for me with with that kind of engagement is it has to be a two-way process and and ultimately if the if the the opposition if you like if they come forward as the opposition then there is not a conversation it's no exactly the, the lines are drawn already so what i always try to promote is come to us with a discussion come to yeah. us with your ideas. it's the engagement isn't it it's and what you said and don't yes. it has to be the other way around as well and yeah. everyone thinks it's just one-sided it is not and no absolutely and, it, and if they come with a proactive mindset things will change and things can yeah. happen for the benefit yeah. of everybody 
Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And I think it's perhaps amazing. about how all of that is communicated between everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Good. Excellent. Thank you both. It's been a, a scintillating one hour. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm grateful to both uh, Lucy and Paul for two very, very interesting um, presentations. Can I thank our two speakers? I would also like to thank our uh, delegates for today, as well as, of course, the people in the engine room, uh, Kaylin and Linda, for running the show and keeping everything um, running smoothly. And um, before I bid you farewell, I would like to reassure Lucy, I, I really enjoyed your reference to poetry. And I wanted to just highlight that the Academy has got its own uh, um, resident poet that contributes a lot to our events and our life. Uh, I don't know if you're a member of the Academy, but if you're not, you're losing out. <laughs> I am, don't worry. <laughs> so, so thank you once again to everybody involved and have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.